uh, we are now live hello everyone good evening i am ishan and you are watching carwan uh, today with us we have two wonderful speakers who are going to discuss a beautifully published book the tale of the horse a history of india on horseback Uh, Dr. Yashaswini Chandra, the author of the book, has a PhD in history of art from SOAS University of London, where she was also a teaching fellow. She has been a guest faculty, a uh, visiting faculty at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and Ashoka University, Sonipat. She worked for Sahapedia, an open online resource for on the arts, cultures, and histories of India for many years. managing the multi volume documentation of the rashtrapati bhavan and institutional collaboration with rupayan rupayan uh, sansthan jodhpur the tale of the horse is her first book she previously co-edited right off the line the president's bodyguard on the household cavalry of the indian head of state she is also an avid horsewoman and her horse is called su a moderator for the for the session our chair today is vikramjeet uh, ram he was born and educated in bangalore after graduating from national institute of design ahmedabad he practiced as a graphic designer for several years his first book elephant kingdom sculptures from indian indian architecture was followed by dreaming vishnu's a uh, journey through central india so and la uh, journey in ladakh and a novel the sun and two seas set in india of the 13th century this conversation will be followed by a question and answer session where we will be taking audience questions so feel free to leave your comments and questions in the live chat box uh, we'll be reading them out and uh, dr chandra will be answering them so without further ado i would i would hand over the stage to vikram uh, to take it forward from here thank you so much and uh, i hope you will enjoy the conversation over to you vikram thank you very much ishan and thank you yashaswini for both of you for extending an invitation to be here today which i couldn't possibly refuse i've had the very great pleasure of reviewing the tale of the horse for biblio around the time it was published earlier this year and so this is a double pleasure for me the book is almost like the gift that keeps on giving so wonderful to be here talking about the book but, but, with the but, author vikram i'm so sorry to interrupt you should specify yes. that i didn't know you until you had finished yes. reviewing my book yes of course <laughs> yes um so yes and this is all about serendipitous connections about chance happenings about happy coincidences about about lots and lots of mutual connections and um yes wonderful to be here thank you yashaswini for inviting me and thank you again ishan um for those of you who don't know it yet this is the book which we're going to be discussing beautifully produced as a handsome hard cover by picador india and um wonderfully illustrated with the fabulous selection of color plates and black and white images interspersed throughout Now obviously the book is about one of the most intelligent sensitive and charismatic animals with whom we human beings have had the great pleasure and privilege of sharing our own histories for millennia um without further ado let me let us just go straight into the book and with your shastri's permission i'd like to read a tiny excerpt which will start off this conversation <clears throat> i quote The horse can offer a singular prism to explore the history of a world still deeply marked by it. Its imprint on India is unique and illuminating. Horses are a thread that connects mythology, history, art, literature, folklore and popular belief. If one is prepared to look for it, the horse is everywhere, even as it seems to be nowhere. and so my first question to you is what prepared you to go out and start looking um thank you vikram for um um for the wonderful introduction to the book i'm so delighted um to be here having this conversation with you i'm so grateful to ishan for hosting us 
Um, Karwan is such a wonderful and worthy um, initiative. And it was a delight. I mean, I reached out to you after reading that wonderful review of the book. And it was, it was very gratifying for me to find all these different connections with you, my, our mutual enthusiasm for art, and of course, horses. So both of us have been riders. Both of us have been very close to horses. We felt the full force. Some more than others, of course, if you don't mind my interrupting. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think, I think you understood where you instinctively understood where I was coming from. It was a place of um, personal interest and involvement. Horses have been a very big part of my life. And I was struck, I mean, um, I, I, I was struck by the paucity of research and literature on horses. In, in the Indian context. I worked on a book, The President's Bodyguard. I co-edited it in the course of managing um, the multi-volume documentation project of the Rashtrapati Bhavan. And that was an incredible experience. And, you know, just writing about that regiment, writing about the central ethos of the regiment, which was the bond between the horses and, the, and men, I really started to think back and imagine how, and wonder about and imagine how powerful it would have been. You know, there was a time when the horse, the histories of horses and humans were intertwined. And I think that because the age of the horse is over, horses are pretty marginal. Um, very few people now have that experience of horses. I think we forget how crucial their presence in human history was, how much human history was shaped by these animals. And when I read whatever little, little literature there was on horses, I was slightly disillusioned by it because, you know, it seemed to, I, it, it seemed to view horses along very cold, prosaic lines, you know, a trade commodity or a fighting machine. Uh, it didn't bring out that crucial factor of a partnership. You know, of course, there were elements of violence to it. Horses were manipulated in the service of humans. But there was also a very, very um, fundamental partnership. And um, so, yeah, I mean, there's now so much interest in the history of emotions, the history of mentality. This... I mean, the relationship between humans and horses really is worth examining from that point of view. So I set out to write a sort of very holistic and interdisciplinary account of the multifarious ways in which the horse manifested itself in Indian history. Yeah. So the, um, the timeline, because the timeline alone is, is quite spectacular. It stretches all the way from roughly 1500 BCE and into the present yeah, and yeah. into the future as well, just in terms of the canvas mm. that you're working mm. with mm. and also the fact that you're, you're, you're not dealing with a fossil or a museum re relic. You're speaking of mm. a living, breathing, hot-blooded and very spirited creature. Yes. And it's always been that way. So if I may ask you, how, how do you organize the sheer range and depth of your material. Where um, do you start? And how much regal room do you allow for serendipity, for, you know, chance, unexpected finds? Because that's something which we are all constantly aware of, hoping for, and sometimes we are lucky. So how do you decide what to include in your story and what has to be sacrificed in the interest or in the service of brevity or keeping the entire narrative tight? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mentioned to you that the previous literature on the horse in India was uh, quite, uh, is quite limited, uh, both in terms of scope and outlook. But I'm very pleased to say that there's going to be another book on horses. The great uh -huh. Wendy Doniger is bringing out a book of her own on horses. It should be coming out in a few months. 
and uh, speaking of serendipity so she is the you know she is the other scholar who works on india who's writing a book on horses who has in the past also um, you know uh, published a few articles on horses she also comes from the pl- same place of personal involvement so she's mm, been a horse yes. woman herself and you know that's what you know we've we've actually got to know each other in this context and we've you know often we exchange notes about our mutual enthusiasm for horses and in almost all our co- uh, conversations we just end up talking about horses and i'm very excited for her book to come out and you yeah. know if the two books are read together then i think it gives you a pretty complete More complete picture. yes yes i mean as far as my she obviously specializes in ancient india so quite a bit of the thrust of a book to a large extent will be um, on ancient india i mean the thrust of my book so exactly there is a dearth of both um primary you know primary consolidated sources the secondary literature is limited so yes um on the one hand it appears that there is very little um you know there's very little material to fall on but if you start looking for it if you start looking across a range of sources whether they're texts or oral traditions or art you suddenly find that the horse was ubiquitous right there are references and references and there are all kinds of mention of the horse uh, you know so it actually is literally like writing the history of cars in today's context except that we are dealing with a living feeling being and that history is so much longer yes you know, uh, the modern mechanized age is a rel- you know began relatively recently that is and the age of the horse lasted for so many more millennia um so how did i decide so i decided on a structure you know um you based on my academic training there are periods where I, uh, periods with which i'm more familiar the late medieval period the early modern period the colonial period to an extent um and then my area of research is rajasthan which is why i make a case study of the book in rajasthan so the focus of my book certainly is on these later periods but it was very important that i don't give the impression that the history of the horse in india began on a tabula rasa you know that i give some context yes of course you know? yes It, the, so the, the story neither begins abruptly nor does it end abru- abruptly which is why sort of i pull into the colonial period uh so that's how the book is structured it consists of chapters concerned with the indian overview so north india south india first of all there's the prologue which sort of sets up the book <clears throat> in terms of like the early history of the horse in india thereafter in terms of the scope and the rationale um and my key arguments and then i move on to chapters which constitute an overview of the indian scene i talk about um the caravan trade in horses from central asia i talk about the sea trade in horses from um you know uh, to the south indian peninsula um and in that way i also cover north india south india then Uh, i think the longest chapter is dedicated to the different breeds of in uh, of horses that emerged in india how that came about and finally there's a chapter on the moguls right and um then then there are a number of dedicated chapters on rajasthan and not because i think that you know the horse culture of rajasthan was the most important the horse culture of Ra- rajasthan of all the historical horse territories of india is still renowned for it yes some of it has to do with the romanticization of rajputs as horse warriors but there are also very good reasons for it having said that it's not like historically rajasthan was the most important horse territory of india it's just that i've chosen to make a case study of it yes. just to be able to have that regional mooring that would allow me to take apart all the different layers that surrounded the history of the horse so i think that yes, is absolutely structure. yes yes um and it's interesting that you speak about about the horses coming in about them being brought in by land and sea 
this is when it's interesting to, to keep reminding ourselves that the horse was never actually endemic in the true sense to the Indian subcontinent. It wasn't a, a creature that was trapped in the wild, for example, like in a kedah or in a stockade and then afterwards broken in and its spirit no. broken and then a howdah or a saddle stuck onto its back and, no, that's and then it's domesticated. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So, so we are actually talking about an animal which was brought in and brought in by people, of course, uh, for specific reasons and purposes, um, as long back as roughly 1500 BCE. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And the, the most incredible thing about the book is that right through it, from, from start to finish, mm. we are with the horse. Mm. We are traveling with the horse. We're making these long, arduous journeys with the horse, either walking by its side or in a boat, or actually sitting on it, and in some cases, actually being the horse itself. Um, I leave it to you. Would you share with us one of those journeys to give a sense of what the horse may have experienced? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. I mean, that has to do it with- It would be lovely to have an excerpt, you reading an excerpt from the book. Yeah, yeah, I will read one, and the thing is that, the, the, you know, that has to do with the form of the book, the journey. It's a journey of the horse through the Indian subcontinent across time and space. And the horse is associated, the horse represents mobility. It, the horse in itself represents a journey. And the horse provides, you know, you read out that excerpt, the horse provides the lenses through which, um, you know, we take a journey through the history of humans in India. So yeah, so the journey as a motif uh, keeps recurring and I will read about one of those journeys. Like Uchay Shravas, the magical white stallion that emerged from the cosmic ocean as a gift for the gods, Bahari or seaborne horses that sailed to India from the ports of the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea through the Arabian Sea were coveted like a treasure. They included Arab horses from the Arabian Peninsula as well as Persian and Iraqi ones. Arab horses were the thoroughbreds of their day, the prized steeds mounted by kings and generals and reserved for elite sports like hunting, racing, and polo. However, the sea horses had anything but a sublime start to their life in India. Packed into ships along with huge reserves of feed and drinking oh. water, the voyage would have been a hideous ordeal for delicate, sensitive horses prone to nerves and colic under the best of circumstances. They were bled before the journey to render them extremely tame and without any vice and forced to stand throughout secured with straps. One can imagine the horses neighing and stamping, scraping their hooves as the ship tossed and turned on the high sea. The deck would have been drenched with their urine, seamen shoveling their dung overboard. The grass and straw that was spread for them to stand on and suppress the smell of urine and manure had to be constantly replaced. Yet, neither that nor the frankincense that was part of the cargo as another popular item of import from Arabia, would have been able to quash the intermingled smells of the sea and the horses. So this is, this sort of represents the sea trade in horses and it, can I actually share my screen? Ishan? Uh, yeah. Ishan, could you, um, Share, could you, any, you know, would it be possible for me to share my screen? Yeah, you can, you can share the screen now. Yeah. Um, it's not really showing up. Can you see my screen? Yes, oh. I can. Fabulous. Uh, 
So I actually thought, uh, so this is actually a lovely mural painting represent that, represent that sea trade in horses that I... Yeah, um, I think we, can, we cannot see the mural. I think there's some dialogue box coming up. Uh, share is paused. What? Resume share. Now, every time I, um, I oh, you, of... you can send it to me and I'll, I'll share it if that's possible. Share. Email it to you. Yeah. Okay. Won't that take time? Yeah. Maybe you can continue with the conversation and, and once okay. I download that and I can show it. Okay. You can't see my screen as of now. Uh, we can, but a dialog box that says open zoom.us. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing as well. Oh, that's so funny. Oh, perhaps you have to select that little box. It says always allow, etc., etc., to open links of this type and then say open zoom US. Yes. So select, maybe select that, check that little box, the dialog box. Yeah, I did that. And then say share. Ah, yes, well done, Vikram. <laughs> I surprised myself yes. constantly. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Wall so, painting. Yeah. So this is the, oh, yes. the sort of yes. the excerpt that I read out, the journey that I just um, uh, you know discussed. It is it evo it's concerned with the sea trade and horses that sort of really took off from at least the 10th, 11th century. And um, that lasted until the early 20th century. I mean, as late as that. And this mm -hmm. uh, incredible mural painting from a temple in Tamil Nadu evokes that sea trade. So. Yes. And so the horse arrives through one of its many routes into the subcontinent. One of its many routes, yeah. The other main route, uh, one of the, the other two uh, main sources um, were, well, one was Central Asia, the horse sort of um, traveled across from Central Asia, basically walked across from Central Asia through the Afghan corridor into India. And um, the uh, second source was Tibet. So through Southern China, that is Yunnan, and the Western Himalayas on one hand and different parts of what is now known as Northeast India on the other hand. And what's equally fascinating is the fact that your research actually uh, provides figures of mortality rates. Yeah. So in yeah. the course of all these journeys, yeah, yeah so which is which is actually, if you think about it, is so phenomenal and and very poignant. Of course, goes without saying. Yeah, because yeah. the book is concerned with the experience of the horse in of terms your, of how absolutely. humans experienced horses, but also the. Yes. The actual the experience of the horse itself. The horse itself, and that comes through very, very vividly, and that's something that um, a number of friends who have actually read the book have have remarked about the um, the visual immediacy of the narrative. Um, I would go a step further and say an almost painterly eye for for landscapes and descriptions of landscapes, some of which are breathtakingly beautiful and merit close and repeated reading. There, I've said it. Um, can you give us one more sample of, of one such description of landscape? Um, I, I have a couple of favorites, but I'll leave it to you. Yeah. You so, know, where you evoke color, temperature, just the mood just builds around the, and purely with words. Uh, he, yeah, because it, it is a journey through the Indian subcontinent I mentioned in terms of form, I think unless you don't evoke different landscapes, you don't really, and there's a purpose also, because, you know, for example, the different horse breeding areas, it is on account of their geography that they lent themselves yeah. to horse breeding. So I thought it was quite important to bring these places alive. And as I'm, as I mentioned, since the book, Rajasthan is at the heart of the book. Um, I, I, and especially Western Rajasthan, and indeed not just Rajasthan, what, what 
is the western frontier so all the way from punjab uh, through uh, sindh rajasthan baluchistan to kutch in gujarat that is at the heart of the book and the desert is very important so i will read out an excerpt in which i describe uh, the desert frontier and this i do in relation to the um, oral epic of pabuji importantly pabuji's adventures unfolded at the desert frontier encompassing western rajasthan and sin before the epic became identified with the ramayan pabuji was reported to have driven camels from sind into rajasthan the agrarian expansion under the growing rajput polity was directed at the fertile zones of eastern and southern rajasthan while the western part remained remained defined by pastoral nomadism rajasthan is effectively divided into two ecological halves by the aravallis this primeval range of low slung hills scattered with hardy dhok trees dangling precariously from rose pink quartzite rock surfaces runs diagonally across rajasthan from south to north on the western side of the hills lies the thar desert which terminates in a shimmering expanse of shifting sand dunes the passage to jaisalmer on the western edge of rajasthan is through the semi arid landscapes of marwar and jungle or bikaner supporting the cultivation of some crops such as mustard and bajra but also revealing the onset of the desert landscape the soil becomes crumblier the air becomes dustier and stunted bushy top care trees and thorny akra plants with fleshy spadel shaped leaves interspersed with tiny star like purple flowers appear succulent plants such as the thor stubbornly sprout from cracks in boulders and spread their translucent green wings on the rocky surfaces where the rocks are covered with thick blankets of sand tufts of kinth and seven grasses appear like smudges of brown and green against a golden canvas the fluffy white flowers of the bui plant are sprinkled like the soft down of the desert thank you very much thank makes you. all the difference to hear it in the author's voice so this happens right through the book and this is something i'd like the audience our audience to know you can expect similar evocations of landscape north south east west criss crossing the subcontinent so the horse is now arrived and it's meant to serve very specific roles and functions some of them are pretty obvious some of them are less well known um that in turn along with landscapes terrains climatic conditions leads to the to the creation of specific breeds of horses could you take us through that story you know um i have critically critically analyzed a number of references by european travelers that dismissed india as a horse uh, you know the horse the horse scene of india and were also very dismissive of you know the breeding practices in india or the ways in which horses were looked after and there these these references are quite spectacular and uh, a lot of these and for example marco polo who is so well known um he he was of that opinion right so these opinions these references have have, have been cited ad nauseum and have been cited ad nauseum to the extent that i mean even when modern historians sort of study um it's looking to look into um as the aspects of the horse um in in indian history i mean they are completely focused on why couldn't horses be bred in india clearly not enough horses were being bred in india that they completely disregard that over time a number of breeds emerged in india most of those breeds are now endangered yes 
you know so i mean if we were to take an interest in their historical emergence that would help us if not preserve these breeds at least value those breeds to have some understanding of them and in any case just as there are references to just as there are num- there were a number of foreign travelers who kept dissing the indian horse scene there were also a number who commended it and who talked about how wonderful the local horses were for example or um, how well people looked after their horses so and there were even abul fazal uh, akbar's chronicler the mughal chronicler even he says at one point and that um, that fine horses are bred in every part of the country and that of course we've paraphrased into the title of the chapter on the indian horse the fine horses bred in different parts of the country yes so i mean in terms of he but he also specifies that although horses were bred throughout um the indian subcontinent there were some areas where horses seem to have been bred in much larger numbers perhaps in herds um the western frontier of course all the way from punjab to kutch um the mughal chronicles are full of references to the kutchi horse so the ancestor of the modern kathiawadi and that is one area which became um uh, you know uh, which which proved fertile breeding grounds then across the uh, across across uh, at the other end there was the western himalayas the western himalayas and uh, what is now known as um northeast india sikkim bhutan such places um the uh, breeding stock for these horses the parent stock would have been the tibetan horses that were also imported through the, uh, that were also imported through the same areas then the maratha started breeding their horses in the bhima valley and um the valleys of uh, tributaries of the bhima river so in the deccan um and i mean horses were bred in india to the extent that by the 18th century i argue that most of the demand for horses in india was being met by the local supply of course these foreign imported cars there was a certain prestige a certain status attached to them they were the more expensive horses so the certain elite classes rode them and that lent an elite value to them so i think that that i mean does that give you a sense of oh yes absolutely absolutely and since you since you brought up the thing of of the of the, the ruling classes the elite classes who were buying these horses as well as maintaining huge stables um is this a good time to be discussing what could well be termed as a golden age of the indian horse or the horse in india more correctly um because in all its many roles and functions be it imperial political military martial transport communication leisure activities and to some extent ritual um it's probably the moguls yeah well that's what i've argued that uh, horse so could we take that conversation further now um supported by visual records visual evidence of how central the horse was to the empire and um its omnipresence so um that is what i in fact argue in the book that horsemanship in india uh, reaches an apogee of sorts under the moguls obviously in the mughal empire in itself was foreshadowed in earlier events uh so i can't say that the, the moguls built on what was available yes. but they also gave it a very specific form um lent certain nuances because of which we could claim that in a way it was the golden age or it was in a, the culmination of the horse culture of india the entire mughal horses were being imported all along but numbers kept growing and growing and growing so and those were primarily persian arab and central asian and central asia yes yeah so the largest supply was of central asian horses mm-hmm. the two largest contingent um 
contingents of horses um, in the Mughal army during Akbar's time consisted of um, horses from Central Asia, so Turki horses, and a, um, and a kind of an Indian horse known as Tazi horses. Yes. And the entire form of the Mughal Empire, I mean, the entire Mansabdari system, which was the central tenant, the pillar of the Mughal Empire, that was based on the on on a ranked officer's ability to bring a certain number of mounted troops to the table. And even sort of the entire sort of bureaucratic military order was based on that. Then there are, the Mughals were constantly gifting horses, receiving horses as gifts. Um, it helped them forge diplomatic relations like, for example, with the Iranian, um, with the Shah of Iran, yes. and, you know, also like all the alliances that they were forging, for example, with the Rajput, there are constant references to the exchange of gifts of horses. Then they, they, they themselves have themselves portrayed very purposefully on horses and specific kinds of horses. So, I mean, I don't... In, and then at one point, Abul Fazal says something to the extent that not only is it crucial for the government, it's an almost super, uh, it's al an almost supernatural means to exalt yourself. And there are so many examples from the Mughal Empire that reinforce that notion, that magical quality of the horse, the, that charismatic quality of the horse, that was almost transformational. And for an art historian, just the sheer wealth of material in the miniatures of the period brings out a whole different story, does it not? Of, yep. of, of lifestyle, of costume, of, of, of practically everything, every single aspect of lifestyle and, and animals, the relationship, the close kinship between human and animal. Yeah. Because if you think about it, even the miniature painters would have been would have been riding horses on their various journeys, accompanying whichever the emperor was. That's so true. Even like uh, painters as court artists, they were all awarded a mansab. So at least in principle, they were required to provide a few num few yes. horses of their own. Twenty five or a hundred, yes, yeah. depending on their. Pecking order, yeah. yeah. And, you know, like you said, when they were following the court, the Mughal court was a mobile court. It was constantly traveling, you know, the Mughals were fighting wars. They were traveling between their different capitals and centers. The artists were also traveling with them and presumably on horseback. Moreover, if you look at all these paintings, the horse is not a prop. The horse is not incidental. It's a carefully considered vital component of these equestrian portraits or paintings that include horses. And they are very, they are made so purposefully that it's very clear that not only did the artist know the animal, not only was the animal, uh, not only were the artists conscious of the value of the animal to say different emperors, but they were also familiar you know, they were familiar and they, and that really comes across. And Can we look, sorry, go on. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. No, no, I interrupted. <laughs> and not only yeah. is the very nature of my book interdisciplinary, because as you um, read out, you read out that line, which I talk about the horse as a thread that connects all these different areas. So not only is the work interdisciplinary, but to be able to demonstrate the pervasive experience of the horse historically, it wasn't just going to be a book about kings and emperors. You know, it was concerned by the people. It was. It also. There's also concern with the people who bred and looked after horses or traded in horses. There's also concern with women, women riders. There's also concern, there is a concern with low, low, lower status groups who did the size, you know, who, who were the sizes of the grooms of horses. And now their histories are not going to be found in court chronicles, for example, or texts. For that, 
you have to look at alternative sources. You have to look at paintings. You have to look at oral traditions. And there is a lot that paintings, I mean, as an art historian, obviously I was inclined towards the art historical, the visual side. But I was myself surprised by the extent to which paintings encapsulate the story of the horse in India. Vikram? I think there's some internet connection issue with Vikram. Oh dear. Uh, oh, he's he's back. back. Yeah, he's oh, back. Fantastic. But could you hear me, Ishan? Yes. Okay. Yeah. There, I think I'm me? back. Yes, I can. I can. Okay. Not too sure what happened. Yes, go on. Yeah, no, so I um, talked about how, you know, if, if, if you're writing a history that also includes the contributions of women or lower status groups or animals, you have to look beyond textual references. You have to do mm -hmm. interdisciplinary research. You have to look at visual sources, oral traditions, literary sources. And um, paintings in particular prove to be a very important source. And there are, con you know, um, I, I mean, a very vital component of my book. Yes. I was wondering whether we could look closely at that particular image of Jahangir playing polo with the princess um, Kuram and Parvez and Baurao. Okay. So, and if you could, and if you could actually read out that section, because that sums up a whole lot of of nuances um, underlying the entire relationship between the Mughals and some of the Rajputs. Also, yeah, and also my enthusiasm for polo. For polo, <laughs> which we'll talk about in in a little more detail of shortly. Uh, so again, like paintings shedding lights on aspects that we might not. Um, find in text like the textual references are to the uh, Rajputs fighting very differently from the Mughals you know not really adopting yes. Yes. warfare riding up to the battlefield dismounting and fighting on foot um, but then there are the paintings that represent the close ties between um, the Rajputs and the Mughals and how the Rajputs were initiated into the same style of riding the same style of equitation and the role of equestrian um, sports in forging connections, you know, creating an inclusive high Mughal culture. So just to read that section. Generations of Mughals and the Kachwaha, so that's the Kachwaha Rajputs, remain close and two Mughal paintings not only capture the intimate relations between the groups, but also the role of elite sports in forging an inclusive high Mughal culture. The first painting, so this painting, is dated to circa 1611. It places Jahangir at the center, surrounded by two of his sons, the princes Khurram, later the emperor Shah Jahan and Parvez, as well as Bhau Singh, the younger son of Man Singh, as they play Chogan, an early form of polo. The scene featuring these characters is superimposed on a painting intended to illustrate the words of the great poet of Shiraz, Hafiz. Congratulations, polo player. The circle of the heavens is beneath your saddle. That is, the heavens do your bidding. Since you have come down as the royal cavalier into the ground, hit the ball. The polo ground consists of a field of grass with burnt orange patches, a pair of stone uprights in the bluish left corner, in the far left corner may represent one of the goalposts. Jahangir rides the same bluish gray horse as in another painting of him from the same period. So this is the second painting. Bhau Singh is mounted on a dun horse, Parvez on a bay, and Khurram on a black. All the horses appear to be Arabs, the preferred mounts in equitation, but also the top class war horses by Mughal standards. The players wear Angarkha tunics, 
that tie across the front to the right side. The tassels from Jahangir is dangling as he raises his polo stick to strike the ball. Parvez also reaches for the ball. It is bright red so as to be visible to the players galloping about. In matches played at night, presumably on grounds lit up by blazing mashals or torches, balls made of the slow-burning wood of palash trees were lit with fire and used. While all the four men are similarly dressed, dandies, even in the midst of a heated <laughs> game of polo, Bhaul Singh is divested of the pearl necklaces worn by Jahangir and the princes a subtle sign of his subordinate position in the scheme of things. Nonetheless, his inclusion besides the emperor and his two sons in a friendly match speaks volumes. The players wear jaunty little turbans rather than helmets. As thick and tightly wound as the former would have been, they cannot have afforded quite the same protection as the latter but appearances clearly mattered in the Mughal top trader. The absence of polo helmets might be a good reason for the long-standing tradition of fatal accidents, including the famous example of the 13th century Sultan of Delhi, Qutubuddin Ebak. Then I go Fantastic. on and on about Fantastic. The, yeah, thanks. Absolute bliss, isn't it, for, a, for an art historian? Because here are these paintings, very small, uh, with stories contained within stories, and um, also stories that aren't very, ob very obvious and immediately known or visible to the, to the at first glance. Speaking yeah. of, of Kuram, Kuram yeah. goes, grow, grows up and becomes Shah Jahan. Yeah. And um, this is where you made, um, a surprising and startling discovery. Mm. Because Khurram we know, or rather Shah Jahan we know, had, a, had an eye for all things bright and sparkly and jewelry and monumental architecture and all of that. But he also had a special fondness for a particular kind of horse. So, so tell us your, tell us about your, your take on Shah Jahan and his piebalds. So Jahangir seems to be, there's a wonderful reference in the Jahangir Nama about Jahangir rewarding some merchant who got this fabulous colored horse from Bukhara, uh, rewarding him with a title. And here you have him represented on the same kind of horse, a gray, basically a gray, a gray or a blue Ruan horse. I mean, in horsey terminology. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, these horses became stock images. But it's quite possible, it's quite likely that they were modeled on actual favorites. So the deportment of the emperor to, I mean, the horse was part of the deportment of the emperor, the bearing of the emperor. So there was a very active conscious choice made in terms of the horse that emperors were depicted as sat on. And as far as Jahangir is concerned, you're right, he was an aesthete. Um, you know, a man of very fine, uh, cultivated taste. He was also, also yeah, yeah, the builder of the Taj Mahal. This is, sorry, what did I say? Doesn't matter. Shah Jahan, we're talking about. Shah Jahan. <laughs> yeah, Shah Jahan. Yes, we're talking about Shah Jahan, the builder yeah. of the Taj Mahal, husband of Mumtaz Mahal. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Father of Aurangzeb. <laughs> and Son of Jahangir. <laughs> yeah, so he, um, he, 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 <laughs> You know, obviously, he was a great art architectural patron. He was also a great connoisseur of gems. He was, had a great fondness for gems. Uh, and, but also horses. So, I mean, at one point, he instructed the governor of Surat, which was one of the main ports through which merchandise came from overseas into the Mughal Empire. He had said that the governor of Surat should keep an eye out for the finest, most exquisite of jewels and horses. And there... There are references in the Shah Jahan Nama to Shah Jahan constantly receiving gifts of piebald horses from Bengal. What does that prove? Well, it proves that the piebald, a piebald is a black and white horse, like in these paintings. It proves that, first of all, the piebald was a strain in that breed of horses that were produced in 
you know, in the upper reaches of Bengal. But also the Chajaha might very well have had a preference for piebald horses. And, um, and come to think of it, yes, again and again and again, in equestrian portraits, and there are about, I think, two dozen of them, Shah Jahan is represented on the same horse. The story of this horse, obviously, you're not going to find the history of an animal uh, in court chronicles. Um, but in paintings, the entire history of a very specific horse is, is available to us. I mean, Shah Jahan is depicted again and again on the same kind of horse. He is represented on the same kind of horse in the manner of a glamorous esthete, the leader of Mughal high society, and even a divine king, right? So in the second one, that is. And where does this horse come from? Well, incredibly in the Padshah Nama, which is the account of the reign of, uh, the illustrated account of the reign of Shah Jahan, you find the scene in which Shah Jahan receives the Iranian ambassador. And we know for a fact that the Iranian delegations were constantly, because Arab Persian horses were so highly valued in the Mughal court, the Iranian um, designations were constantly making very you know, uh, rather magnificent, making gifts of magnificent horses to the Mughal emperors. The Shah of Iran was himself constantly sending gifts of horses. Um, and you have this painting where uh, the Iranian ambassador seems to be presenting Shah Jahan with horses amongst other gifts, all the other gifts. And the horse that is standing foremost and sort of seems to is portrayed in a manner, you know, standing apart from the rest of the horses as if it is the most, it's, it's, the, it's the special one intended as a special gift to, um, for Shah Jahan. And if you were to look, and here's the genius of the artist, and here is the attention to detail. If you were to look, the spotting pattern is the same. So much so that, for, that this fine splattering at the neck, is almost the same in this famous equestrian portrait of Shah Jahan by Payag, right? So I make, I make the argument that, that there was a Persian horse that was gifted to, and we also know that in Iran itself, piebald and skewbald horses, so white and brown horses, or white and bay horses, <laughs> to use the correct terminology, that is white and brown horses, they, they weren't really, there was, they were sort of disdained in a number of cultures, actually, piebalds and skewbalds were disdained, but not in India. There was a great taste for them. And um, Arab horses were crossed with other horses to produce these distinctive horses. Yes. So it's, so it's <laughs> you know, so I argue that here, here is the case of the Iranian ambassador having gifted a very special looking horse to Shah Jahan, the horse capturing Shah Jahan's fancy, uh, uh, fancy and thereafter Shah Jahan choosing to have himself represented on the same horse again and again in very many different uh, in very many different moments in very yes. different yeah so um, yeah we have then amazingly there are two instances one from the Padshah Nama and um, the second is this painting when the youngest son of uh, Shah Jahan, Murad Baksh, is depicted on, if not the same piebald, another piebald reflecting the taste for piebalds in the Mughal court. And but in, in fact, in this group portrait, the spotting pattern is almost exactly the same. So of course, I say in the book that it's a charming thought that Shah Jahan would gift his favorite horse to his youngest boy on special occasions. Um, yeah, and obviously there is a certain artistic logic that you have to... Of course. Uh, yeah, like yes. for example, why is this, if it's the same horse, why is it so small? Well, because, you know, it is, its shy, size has been shrunk to represent the youngest, uh, the youngest position and perhaps the Hierarchy. size yeah. of the son of Murad. Yes. 
And here we have. And of course, at no point is anything just incidental. Nothing is just added on for. No. As a prop. Yes. Every no. every single element in these paintings has a meaning, has a very specific story to it. Yeah, and there's there is it, documentation is a big part of it. Like for example, of course, the, the visual Bhattu. records, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're visual records. Like there he is, Shah Jahan once again on the piebald, while uh, uh, while his um, son, while Aurangzeb then a prince, That's yeah. yeah, confronts an elephant gone rogue, um, in the course of an elephant fight. Then this is the other painting I talk about when I talk about the close bonds between Rajputs and the Mughals and the role of elite sports in forging those ties. Because yes. here you have um, Jai Singh, another Kachaha ruler, and you have um, charged Suja, and they're both rushing to Aurangzeb's rescue, displaying the same riding style and the same instincts. No? Mm -hmm. Then, okay, so it's not just the Mughals. Here's this of course, picture. because they're parallel and almost concurrent uh, goings on deeper south. Yeah, so no, but the love of pie bowls and skew bowls. Mm -hmm. There's this painting from this Deccany painting from the Deccan, in which mm -hmm. the horse is very much at the heart of it. The horse is the most dominant character in the painting. It looms large, it you know, occupies the most most of the canvas, and it's a skew bowl. Yeah. So, you know, horses are not just valued for their hardiness, for example, as war animals, but also their appearance. They're effectively a luxury item by the end of it, you know, they're a status symbol. Yes. Then coming the pie world. So this is much later. This is the 18th century from a minor Rajput court, Kishangar, an art, one of the artists, Bhavani Das, who actually trained in the Mughal imperial atelier. He started to specialize in drawing paintings of the most um, prized horses in the stables of um, the Maharaja of Kishangarh. They have the two paintings that two of these paintings were of Iraqi and or Iranian uh, horses, and both of them are sky bold, uh, pie bold. So that 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 elitist love of you know horses from the Middle East continues. Mm -hmm. That taste for pie bold horses continued. Then there's a manuscript, uh, the Shalihotra manuscript. Um, this manuscript concerned with. Um, you know, from Rajasthan, which uh, has a catalog of the auspicious, of auspicious and inauspicious horses. So one of the um, one of the kinds of horses which are deemed auspicious were these skew balls and pie balls, and it continues into the present. So some of the um, and the you know the most um, you know, highly valued horses that sell at traditional livestock fairs um, like Pushkar are piebald horses. Right. Yeah. So. Fabulous, fantastic. So what, 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 were, what was happening further south? What was happening in the Deccan? At the period well, concurrent with the, with the Mughals? Because the other, the other martial clan with the mm -hmm. Marathas, and they have a very, very close bond with the horses again, which were reared yeah. and bred specifically for, for warfare. So I think by the 18th century, those Marathas had started breeding their own horses, perhaps in, mm -hmm. um, in, in collaboration with certain pastoral nomadic groups of the Deccan. Um, to an extent, uh, to an extent, the, these breeding practices were also tied to the farming practices uh, of Maratha farmers. And uh, the, so the Maratha light mobility, of course, gave the Mughals a run for its, uh, the Maratha light cavalry, of course, gave the Mughals a run for their money and became renowned for its mobility. And by the end of it, they were they had conquered different parts of India or were conducting raids into different parts of India. And their, uh, their battle tactics were an antithesis to Mughal battle tactics, which, you know, which depended on the coordination between all these different arms. So like a Mughal army was a very large and slow moving um, 
entity where the, the Maratha armies, the Maratha light cavalry consisted of these packs of fast riding horsemen who used to sort of cut off supply lines, plague the Mughal army and just make life generally very difficult for them. And it's these horses that they bred, horses of a particular type, small agile horses that enable that kind of mobility. So that entire Maratha supremacy, you know, the success of the Maratha light cavalry was dependent on the kind of horses they bred. And there are some really lovely references to some colonial commentator or the other commenting on how much the Marathas loved their horses, how much they valued them and how much they used to feed them all kinds, give them all kinds of special treats. So yeah, another class of homegrown indigenous horses, which are now extinct. So it's no longer- What were they called? These were the, these were the oh. Dakinis. Huh, they were the Deccani or the, Bhim, the, the Deccani horses, Bhima ponies. And this, right. this breed is now extinct. It's lost. And only because we haven't taken an interest. Along came the British and they sort of, they were highly critical of the Indian, in, Indian horse breeds and the Indian horse scene. And um, they cracked down on pastoral nomadism that horse breeding was tied to. They also sort of sealed the porous boundaries surrounding the subcontinent were also increasingly sealed. So, for example, if the Afghans could no longer that easily come um, from across the Khyber or through um, the Suleiman Mountains and do trade in India. And the whole scene changes. And, you know, and so much of our understanding of the historical horse scene of India is mediated by that colonial view which was very dismissive of it. So we have failed to recognize that there were all these breeds of horses that are endangered and one of them is actually extinct. You know, the Bhima mm -hmm. ponies, for example. And yet at the same time, there are two other breeds, the Katyavadi and the Marwari, which, which are doing extremely well even today. No, if you look are, at Rajasthan, Gujarat. They are endangered. I think the um, export of Marwari Kathiawari horses, if I'm not mistaken, is banned because there are such few of them. And mm -hmm. Professor Utpal Tato at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, who's been doing a lot of genetic research on horses, he told me that there are actually very few pure Marwari or Kathiawari horses left because they've been crossed with thoroughbreds, for example, in recent times to the extent... Right. But yeah, at least in Rajasthan and Gujarat, there is awareness, there are horse preservation societies. So, you know, that is still somewhat intact. So can we go back to Rajasthan then? Can we, can we get a clearer understanding of what exactly happens with the horse scene in Rajasthan? Why is it so central there? Why? Oh yeah. Because so to, to, to a large extent, um, you think about horses and you think about Rajasthan. You think about, you know, even the present context. Like I said, some of it has to do with the romanticization of Rajasthan at the hands of colonial historians such as James Scott. Right. Yes. Um, who wrote uh, about, you know, who made some of these very, some of these horsey stories, for example, um, the, the, uh, the, the Chetak, the Chetak. Yeah, yeah. So the, the partnership Rana between Rana yes. Pratap and Chetak, uh, yes. you know, or Prithiraj Chauhan sort of storming uh, mm -hmm. Sanjukta Swayambar and sort of carrying her off on his horse. So he made these stories very popular and he sort of sold them as the authentic history of the Rajputs. So, I mean, all of that. And he he compared, so the romanticization of, Rajput, of um, Rajasthan, specifically the Rajputs, included comparing them to medieval um, European knights. Oh. So, you know, mm. that whole idea of this chivalrous horse, this chivalrous um, horse riding knights was born. So there is some of that also, but there are actually very good reasons why Rajasthan emerged as a horse territory. The Rajputs did take to horses. I mean, there was a period where there was a shortage of horses in Rajasthan. Not enough horses were available. Not enough horses were being bred. But increasingly, they realized the value of horses in establishing their rule in different parts of Rajasthan. And um, they, the, the, their 
their incorporation to the Mughal Empire, as also instances of resistance to the Mughal Empire, was mm-hmm. informed, uh, um, you know, were informed by the horse. Then culturally also the horse became a very important symbol. Then the other has to do with the pastoral nomadic culture of the place. I mean, th- this was an area where there was very little agriculture, but there were lots of grasslands. Horses could be raised in... Of course, uh, yes. yes. In herds, there were pastoral classes. There were nomadic mm. classes who, ra- who may, you know, it, is, it was the lifestyle, livestock economy of the place. And then its location. Because you see, it lies bang in the middle of um, one of the routes from Central Asia through Afghanistan. So this is from across the Suleiman Mountains into um, Multan or later Shikarpur, um, you know, through Bahawalpur, Bikaner, uh, in the case of Shikarpur, through Jaisalmer. So this was one of the main routes through which horses were transferred from Central Asia and Afghanistan into India. Then also the ports of Sindh and uh, Gujarat. So horses were also being imported by sea through Rajasthan, or at least passing through Rajasthan from Sindh and Gujarat. So for these reasons, it did emerge as one of, so that, that there is a very solid basis to that reputation. And it is home to one of the modern recognized breeds of horses, the Marwari horse. Right, yes. Hmm. And central to all this is also- We're not running out of yes. time, are we? No, I think we're doing fine. Um, central to the whole Rajasthan horse culture mm. is is something far deeper and far more rooted in philosophy, in cultural oral histories, which is the Pabuji story, which you touched upon very briefly earlier in our conversation. Would yes, you tell so us a little more about the Pabuji mythology? Yes, so the Pabuji tradition, um, it is it consists of an oral epic that is actually so long and complex that it can only be recited over seven nights. Then it also includes a number of stories um, and songs. Some of the stories started to be recorded, different um, iterations of the story of Prabhuji began to be recorded from about the 16th century but it is supposed to reflect semi-historical events that took place in the 14th century. So it's an excellent source for the early history of the Rajputs. And from the point of view of my book, of course, it was, it was, it was, so it was bang on as a source because I mean, it's a very long and complex story with a huge cast of characters. So I can't really get into it, but I mean, at, the main storyline consists consists of a blood feud between Pabuji, a chief of the Rathor clan of Rajputs, and Jindrao, his rival, um, the chief, a chief of the Kichi um, clan of Rajputs, and their rivalry erupts over their, um, you know, over this one black mare. I mean, both of them want the black mare, Kesar Kalmi, and that is metaphorical. It is metaphoric, it, it, it is a metaphor for, I mean, it, 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 it is a throwback on a time when horses were not that readily available in Rajasthan. Rajputs were fighting amongst themselves for the best of horses. Then um, it, Kesar Kalmi in some of these accounts is also the reincarnation of Pabuji's mother. So it's also a metaphor for, you know, yeah. the close bonds between riders and their horses. You know, it's represented as a familial tie. And there are, par- there are very similar stories from, uh, uh, you know, uh, from Rajasthan. And also it, also, it also draws attention to a number of other groups. For example, it's not just a swashbuckling saga of Rajput, Dash and Daring. It's also, um, you know, it. It it's also reflects a number of intercaste alliances. For example, the the mare is given to Babuji by this Charan woman. So cha, the Charans um, are uh, were a bardic class, and um, the Charans 
you know, it, the Charans provided court poets to the Rajputs. A number of Charan goddesses were adopted by the Rajputs as their um, clan goddesses. And um, the Charans also traded in horses and bred, um, bred horses. So, you know, the, that, that is also reflected, the, the history of the Charans is also reflected in uh, the Pabuji tradition. And then a, a lot of um, Pabuji's comrades were Bheels, Bheel archers. So, you know, the fact that they also used to ride horses once upon a time, that they were also identified as a martial class of sorts. I mean, all of this is reflected in the epic, in the tradition of Pabuji. And this is a tradition which continues to the very present day. I mean, it's wobbling into the present. Um, seven day perform seven night performances are increasingly there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, a number of the you know the the um, Bheel Nayak, the the uh, pr the priest the priest bards the Bhopas of the Bheel Nayak community that recite the um, oral epic of Babuji against such a cloth scroll painting. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're increasingly like improvising, you know, singing, you know, performing within the tourist circuit of India, of, sorry, of Rajasthan. Right. So, I mean, yeah, changing times. Changing times. But there's another very fascinating um, um, living tradition which continu continues and is alive and well diametrically across the subcontinent in Manipur. And that brings us to, to the polo story. Yeah. So, I mean, on the one hand, now, obviously, the book is representative rather than an encyclopedia. Yes, I, think I would have liked to write about polo in all the different regions of the subcontinent and beyond, but I couldn't have done that. The next so, book. <laughs> the next book. Yes. Um, volume two. Volume two. Uh, uh, so, so, I talk about like the courtly culture of polo. So elite yes. polo, the polo that was played within elite Mughal and Rajput circles. But I also talk about local forms of polo. Like, for example, in Gilgit Baltistan, forms of polo, um, early forms of polo were played. And in Manipur. And Manipur is actually really interesting. And I make a case study of it. Because first of all, as, I sa as I've said, uh, the Western Himalayas and the Northeast represents the other sort of catchment area through which a distinctive body of horses were imported into India and a region where different breeds of horses emerged. And in Manipur, at some point, they started breeding their own horses, the, 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 the modern day Manipuri. And, um, and they started playing a very particular form of polo. And in fact, the British watch the Manipuris play polo in the Northeast. And that is how mm -hmm. modern polo was born. So it's mm -hmm. actually Manipur is the birthplace of modern polo. So it was really worth. And then you have a case of, so this is really interesting. Here is a photograph. Uh, and both these photographs I got from our mutual friend, Shomi Roy. Yes, who, by the way, is probably watching us right now. I hope now. he is because he is doing a fantastic job Yes. Serving Manipuri ponies and, you know, the local form of the game and also promoting it and trying to give it a world stage. And who would have imagined that there's a women's polo team there? They're beautiful, beautiful costumes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. More, we need more and more women polo players. Yes, of course. There was a time when you have paintings of like, um, you know, all these uh, elite women from, yes. uh, you know, Rajasthan or the Mughal women playing polo. Um, so, you know, I don't see why that tradition can't continue into the present. Of course, so, and also because the book itself is so filled with so many women who appear through the pages of your book. There's, of course, the saber-wielding Rani Lakshmibai of Jhansi and the trigger-happy and polo-playing Noor Jahan. Yeah. Um, there are a whole lot of other women also. There's Fanny Parks, there's the Maharani of Gwalia, am I right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Baizabai. Um, Baizabai. There's, there's oh, Akbar's yeah. mother and her companions. There's that lovely, lovely image in the book. Can, can, do you have it? Is it readily accessible? That image of Hamida Banu Begum being received into 
quickly. Yeah, there you are. Yeah, so this corner. <clears throat> this corner, the women with their beautiful cowls and their... Yeah, so the poshest of the posh, hat. the poshest of the posh used to either travel in palanquins in the case of these processions or in howdahs on elephant back. Yes. So their female servants used to accompany them on horseback covered from head to toe. <laughs> Yeah. I love the sleeves and the saddle, the saddle, the details of the saddle. Well, I love the horses. Look at the profiles. It's beautiful. Of course. Goes without saying. Vikram, I'm concerned yes. we're going, uh, we are uh, going over time. What do you think? Okay. So um, just before we quickly wrap up, um, what, do you, what do you see the, the, the story of the horse in the present day? I mean, the age Where of do you the think horse. it's going? Is it over? Is there hope? The age of the horse is over. Horses are never going to be central to um, human civilization the way that they once were. Their use is mm -hmm. restricted either to certain remote areas where they still continue to provide the best means of transport. Um, or to ceremonies and Ceremonies, such like. yeah, elite equestrian sports, it's only a small, small, small groups. Yes. Um, you know, but, you know, in many ways, it, the remnants of the traditional horse culture of India can still be seen at livestock fairs like Pushkar mm -hmm. or in Kola mm -hmm. Mahalla, when you see the Nihangs race their horses and practice the lines of gymnastics on horseback. I mean, it's just, it's very beautiful to go and watch because it is very evocative of a time when the horse, when horses filled our past. Of course, which we can only imagine now. Yes, which we can. Which brings, back. which now brings me to my last question to but you. Can Yaka I make Sidi? a quick? Yes, point. yes, yes. But the potency of the horse you endures. Know? Oh, absolutely. It endures, and it's seen. And how? Yes. Yeah, and it's seen when, for example, Dalit bridegrooms in certain remote backward parts of North India are still prevented from riding on uh, in their marriage processions on horseback. You know, so. That is that is a reflection on the extent, you know, that is it it is a powerful symbol of uh, Dalit resistance, for example, the horse to date, even the con in the context of a modern republic. So yeah, I just thought I'll make that point. Yes. <laughs> when it comes to writing about about subjects such as horses and yes um i guess we some of us come from a place of personal investment personal passion would you tell us about your personal connection with the horse and equitation yeah i've ridden most of i've ridden most of my life i mean i ride as regularly as possible just today i had the most incredible early morning canter and uh, yeah I can't even describe I, they I can't even describe what like for example my horse means to me or the thrill of sitting on horseback or it's just this bond you feel so close like today when I was out riding I felt so close to my horse I felt so close to nature it's just incomparable it's just and that clearly is something which everyone who's been riding horses in India all the way from 1500 BCE has probably felt and hopefully has always felt. It uplifts life. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yasha Swini, for a fabulous Thank conversation. This was Ishan. an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And thank you, Ishan, for hosting us. I think we have some time for five minutes for questions. I hope we like haven't it. gone on for too long, Ishan. Oh, no, 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 not at all. It was such an enriching conversation. I got to learn much more than the book itself. So thanks, thanks. <laughs> I spent five years much. reading it and you telling me <laughs> five years writing it and you telling me a one hour long discussion. <laughs> no, it's a, it was such an engaging conversation and you know all that anecdotes that you talked about and I think when uh, our viewers going to when our viewers get the book, uh, the the link is in the chat in the description of the video. So when they'll read the book, they'll they'll understand the book much more clearly. I think after after listening to the conversation. Uh, so thank you so much, Vikram, and thank you so much, Yashas. Thank, thank you, Isham. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have, we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience, mm -hmm. and I'll read out those for you. 
This one is from Harshvardhan Elu. This question is: It is generally believed that the horse is not an endemic to India. It implies that horse entered India along the migrant Indo-Aryan language group. Can you please provide us some earliest archaeological historical evidence of horse in India? Do, you, do did you discuss these aspects in your works? And can you throw some light on historicity of horses? Yeah, so I think it's pretty well established based on archaeological. Although there has been a debate about it, um, it is pretty well established based on archaeological evidence that the native population of wild horses disappeared by 8000 BCE, and thereafter, because increasing, increasing, um, increasing amounts of evidence have been, uh, has, uh, you know, have come have come to light from 1500 BCE. We um, we relate the emergence of the horse, the inflow of horses into the subcontinent, that reintroduction of horses, uh, with the migrate with the Indo-Aryan migrations, right? Which obviously unfolded very very gradually over many many um, centuries. And uh, what we do know, of course, is the centrality of the horse and the horse-drawn chariot to Indo-Aryan culture. That is very well established. You know, um, Vikram, you were the first in interlocutor I had who didn't mention uh, one line from my book, which is that the horse is mentioned some 30 times more than the cow in the Rig Veda. <laughs> Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that the next time. I know, <laughs> always get asked about that. Yeah. So, yeah, so we know. So I think that is a very good starting point for the history of the horse in India. But, but I will not say that the horse was like, was not indigenous to India. It was a foreign animal because at the end of the day, it became an Indian animal. You know, it lived the whole... The horses were available in India in large numbers from at least 1500 BCE. You know, um, even those horses that were, uh, you know, that were imported into India effectively became Indian horses. Breeds of horses were developed in India. So I will not say that it was some sort of an alien animal. Yeah, but it was not native to India. Yeah, just in addition to that, we have a question coming up with Wendy Doniga, where where she is going to talk about horses in mycology and history. So that might be fascinating for our viewers. Uh, that is scheduled for 22nd of June. So just a self-promotion in between. I'm really sorry for this. No, I think it's fantastic. No, looking because, forward to that. Yes. I think it's fantastic because until recently, there was hardly any literature on the horse in India. Sunday, there are two books. So yes. the horse finally has its day in, under the sun. And I'm so glad that two horse women have written these two books. Yes. Uh, another question is uh, by so we'll take only two more questions this is by Abdul Khan his question is did the Mughals show a preference for imported horses or they preferred the local breeds especially the rulers you you obviously talked about Shah Jahan but what about the other rulers oh yeah it was it's very well established they the the uh, Arab Persian horses were considered the most prestigious horses Central Asian or Turkey horses uh, provided the rank and file of um, the Mughal army. And while there are references to the regard in which they held Kachi horses, you know, and made very special gifts of Kachi horses, um, Indian horses weren't quite considered in the same league. Uh, so the last question for the evening is by Punita Singh. Her question is, you spoke of Surat as a port of entry. Out further south, when you go to Kalikat, apparently shiploads of Arab horses came there too. So where did they end up? So, sorry, whose birds are those? Uh, the <laughs> Arab ho uh, Persian horses, the horses that were being imported by sea, some Central Asian horses were also being imported by sea. And, you know, um, and some Arab Persian horses were also being uh, imported by uh, or through overland routes. But, you know, the horses that were imported by sea, they arrived at all the, at a number of different ports. And I discussed the rise and fall of certain ports in the book, like Bhaktal, how it was once very important. 
And with the coming of the Portuguese, the Portuguese made sure that all the horse trade, the sea trade in horses was directed through Goa, you know, their, their, their capital in India. So, I mean, there were a number of ports which were important. There were a number of ports, you know, throughout the Indian Peninsula and all its different coasts where um, horses were received. For the Mughals, because the Mughal Empire, um, I mean, for the longest time, as far as the Mughal Empire was concerned, their main port of entry was Surat and um, Yambe. Thank you so much, Yashasvini, for answering all the audience questions. And thank you so much, Vikram, for beautifully uh, moderating and sharing the conversation this evening. I hope this thank, you, Ishan, for... thank you, Ishan. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you for moderating beautifully as well. <laughs> this is going to Pleasure. be very helpful for students of history and those of uh, our audience who might be interested in researching in horses further. And we, we need more scholarship on horse, I think, uh, because there's, there's always a debate on horses in India. So uh, we hope to have you both again on Carvan sometime soon. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.